Good morning. I am at the Bluff Creek State Natural Area. And uh, this is a very special habitat as a state, state natural area, state natural area. Uh, it's been designated as one that is a little more special, a uh, better collection of rare species, uh, really a rare habitat type. So we'll see different parts of this habitat. I'll make some separate videos that we can walk through the different habitat types. Uh, for starters, I'm in a kind of shaded area just near the start, uh, the entrance of the property right by the highway here. Uh, we'll see a little bit of wetland influence already coming in. So uh, looking down at our plants at my feet, I don't see, I don't really see any flowers at the moment, but I've got some identifiable plants, uh, some that are worth talking about here. Uh, maybe we'll start in with one of our flowering plants. This one's in flower. Uh, this is the uh, tall meadow rue, the Lictrum daisy carpum. Uh, we saw this at one other site before this. So this one uh, looks to be a male plant. And uh, this particular male plant has already done its flowering. So I can see the inflorescence here where flowers were attached. Some of them still are, are kind of visible there. Uh, but a lot of them have fallen apart. So male flowers, male parts of inflorescences, they're kind of short-lived. So the function of the male part of the flower is to disperse pollen. And once that's done, once it's gotten rid of its pollen, it's pretty well done its job. Uh, female flowers or fem female flowers with female components, they stick around for longer because they then develop into fruits. So uh, one of these here, uh, this looks to be one of our asters. So um, sunflower family, not flowering right now. Uh, maybe just call your attention to the habit of the graminoids here. So there's some grass relatives in here. Uh, looks like we do have some actual grasses. So uh, grasses or sedges. As you'll see, this is going to turn into a pretty wet habitat uh, as we learn more about it. And so in wet habitats, that's the place where we often find a lot more of the uh, sedges in our graminoid group. But this one is actually a grass. Uh, we've got the leaves coming out at opposite sides of the stem. So not opposite leaves, these are alternate leaves, but they're coming out uh, on different sides of the stem. They call that being two ranked. So if you were to lie this plant down, the leaves come out to the top and then to the bottom uh, along the stem. Big sheaths on our uh, leaves here, along with a ligule, I think you can see there. So that uh, papery bit that's heading upwards uh, was around the stem and now it's just heading up uh, attached to the leaf. I'm peeling this away, the part that's coming off. This is still part of the leaf. This is a sheath. And uh, grasses and sedges have quite substantial sheaths. And so this whole leaf is, is really all of that and maybe even more that I peeled away. Uh, it's kind of a protective function that the leaf bases can protect the stem. Uh, a little bit, let's see, over here we've got some... So a lot of these graminoids, grass relatives, are not flowering. Uh, this one is. And I might have to get a... I don't have an idea on that right away, but it looks like a special one that I'm not too familiar with. So I'm kind of curious to see what this turns into uh, when I identify it. Uh, others in this herbaceous layer here, uh, I noticed some horsetails. So horsetail is a good example of a plant that likes to grow in wetlands. This is a fern relative. So in your book, you'd find it in ferns and relatives. And uh, has a, a hollow cylindrical stem, has kind of a, almost like a roughened feel, a little bit like a, like a fine grain sandpaper. Uh, there actually are silica crystals inside of the cells of these plants, or like maybe on the outside of the cells of these plants, uh, one of their defenses against getting chewed on. Uh, if this were to be reproductive, and often you find them just sterile like this one, uh, when they're reproductive, they have a cone at the top of spores, uh, really reminding you that we belong to the ferns and friends group. Uh, among our grasses, we've got, so in this area, you'll see some, some very special rare plants and also some that are uh, really not too special. So kind of a combination of rare and maybe uh, new invaders to the habitat. So this is the inflorescence of a reed canary grass. Uh, pretty much a, a ubiquitous plant in wetlands. It's hard to get out uh, once it gets in there. The inflorescence can look 
uh, really clustered together like this one does and sometimes they spread out a little bit more um, I know this plant is all over but I, I honestly sometimes uh, get mistaken about what it is uh, I have to remind myself that it's quite a variable plant so uh, reed canary grass I think I pointed this out once before um, leaf blades head out quite whoosh like right angle to the stem and uh, not too densely in here as far as I can tell a handful of reed canary grass plants uh, we've got a milkweed here this is our common milkweed they're uh, opposite leaves pinnate venation when you pull the leaves apart you get uh, milky sap is a good way to verify the old milkweeds there uh, I see an interesting little scrambling plant with uh, this kind of leaflet. And I don't see any flowers yet, so we might not be able to talk about this. This looks like a, a member of the bean family, so vets or something like that. Uh, looking over here, I don't know if you can see it. Um, this one is stem twining around a grass right there, so... Uh, pinnately compound leaves, entire leaflets, and uh, the bean family, often we see um, kind of swollen or fatter bases of the leaves and leaflets. Um, just a little bit more like they, they sometimes have the ability to actually move themselves one way or the other. Uh, another herbaceous group in the herbaceous layer down here. Uh, we have one, we don't get a lot of plants that have world philotaxis. So we have an example here of world philotaxis. Uh, this one is called Joe Pieweed. Uh, Eutrochium, probably Eutrochium maculatum, no flowers just yet. Uh, these get quite tall with big flower heads on them later in the year. Let's keep going. So really rich in species already and we've hardly gotten started. Um, maybe you can see down in there, we've got some sprays of white flowers. Try to get a little more of this. <clears throat> uh, here's another one that has world philotaxis. Uh, and it's actually a group of plants that are pretty abundant and diverse uh, called the bed straws. Genus is gallium in the matter or coffee family. And... Uh, this one, world of four leaves at a node. And another thing you see about gallium, uh, this one has quite a few flowers at the top. Uh, four petaled flowers, that's a little bit unusual for the dicots, the uticots. And uh, pretty small, I don't know if we could get in there to, to tell the details. Uh, one thing you look at if you're trying to key out one of these is the, uh, the nature of the ovary. So these have inferior ovary. Um, where are we at? <laughs> Not in focus. Uh, sometimes they're they're a little bit prickly on those. Sometimes the whole plant, plant is a little bit prickly. Uh, so the form of the leaves, I think this is the northern bed straw, if I remember the common name right. And uh, you might see what its wetland characteristics are. Uh, another nice tall example of that meadow rue. So here we got lots of male flowers. Uh, another male plant with uh, male flowers that are still really kind of in their, in their prime. Um, and then along the stem, we can see there's some twining again of that bean family vetch or something like that. Moving into the woody layer of this habitat, I uh, see we've got some members of the blackberry group. So uh, pretty distinctive leaflets of three, sometimes five. Uh, the, the genus is Rubus and the rose family. Prickles along the stem and uh, no flowers just yet, so uh, I would take a guess, maybe this is just our uh, common one that's called a black raspberry. Uh, here's some that are developing. So we've got some developing fruits right there. Um, yeah, I'd say probably a good chance of black raspberry. That's one that is really good at getting around. Uh, I guess maybe at my feet, I'll do another herbaceous plant before we move on. A good example of a herbaceous plant that shows up in wetlands. This is the uh, touch me not. It's going to flower later in the year. Uh, really juicy plant. So just like squishing the stem, it's it's almost surprising this plant can support itself. It's just so juicy on the inside. Uh, doesn't feel tough really. So uh, pretty pretty durable in the wetlands. Uh, we got opposite leaves, 
and this wavy toothed margin. Pretty distinctive. I can make these out even when they come up as seedlings um, based on their leaves and also the habitat. So if I see something like that growing in a wetland, I can usually flag it as one of these. Uh, this plant gets some, some interesting attention for being a uh, potential, I don't know, soothing cure for uh, poison ivy exposure. Haven't tried it myself, but give it a shot sometime. All right, also in our uh, woody plants, we've got some examples of, um, this is an aspen. So let me flag this part first, maybe. This is a grapevine growing up, so palmately veined leaves, uh, lobed, sometimes deeply lobed, serrate teeth on the margins, uh, and then obviously these big tendrils that are coming off. I like watching them this time of year where they, they're just getting their tendrils established, so the tendrils are uh, really juicy and, and they respond to touching what they encounter. So this plant kind of learns as it goes along uh, what kind of environment it's in. Uh, this is an older tendril that's managed to wrap around the stem there. Uh, the plant that it's growing on, let me put the grapevine out of the picture. Uh, this is an aspen. Aspens have pretty distinctive uh, leaf shape, so we call this a uh, like a deltoid, sort of a triangular leaf shape, um, a, a fully truncate leaf base, so the base goes out in right angles. Um, interesting feature, the petiole is flattened um, up and down relative to the leaf blade, and that creates an interesting effect uh, when the wind blows. This is a plant that has uh, leaves that I'd say wiggle around more than most trees. Uh, it's actually called, its common name is the quaking aspen. Uh, it's actually in the scientific name Populus tremuloides, so tremu uh, trembling sort of, trembling aspen. Um, this actually looks like a different kind of uh, member of the bean family. Uh, the other one we saw did not have the tendrils at the leaf tips, and this one has a tendril on the leaf tip. Uh, also what we call a winged stem. So this wing, uh, stem is, uh, has extensions, so flat extensions heading out um, in two directions in this case. So winged is a, a characteristic you sometimes see in keys. Um, just means like a flat extension. Doesn't mean anybody's going flying or anything like that. Uh, no flowers on that one to use to identify it. Some rich flora in here today. Uh, here's one of our dogwoods. So we can do the dogwood test on the leaf here. Uh, venation basically matches the dogwood. We have opposite leaves. And I'll break this apart. And those sturdy veins hold that leaf on there. Uh, in fluorescence, we've got four parted, uh, four petaled flowers. Um, don't usually in the keys need to use the flowers themselves to identify the plant. Uh, sometimes the inflorescence form, so we have a panicle type of inflorescence here. This might turn into a long video. I just keep seeing new plants. Um, not a lot that are in flower again. We might, uh, when we get into the sun, we might see some more that are flowering in a different part of this habitat. Uh, here we've got one that's a monocot, so parallel veins uh, running parallel for most of this leaf. They, they join at the base and then they join again at the tip, but most of the length, they're parallel, the main veins. This is one of our, uh, uh, shoot, um, false Solomon seals, myanthemum. Uh, I'm not going to guess on that one just yet. We've got false Solomon seal and regular Solomon seal uh, look pretty similar in the vegetative states. Uh, very different once you get the flowers coming up. We'll probably see some of those as we go. Uh, another one that is related to one I showed you before, the Joe Pie Weed. Uh, this one is called Bone Set. And it has a feature I showed you at the prairie. This is uh, leaves that are perfoliate. So leaves that are opposite of each other, but they're uh, joined at the base. So these are technically two separate leaves. This is a stem, uh, but they join together like this. And uh, don't see that too often in leaves. Um, bone set. Something about having medicinal qualities if you break a bone. Uh, let's go through here. We've got a uh, one of our honeysuckles. 
So here's one with some flowers, or some fruits, sorry. Those are some fruits. Uh, fruits are paired on plants of this family. This is uh, called Capra Foley, A-C-E. And our honeysuckles are some of our more uh, notorious invasive plants in the area. Uh, opposite leaves, you can tell that they're simple leaves because we've got the uh, axillary buds in there. Um, they just kind of, to me, the honeysuckles kind of look like they have softer leaves. This one's got hairy leaves, uh, elliptical, entire margins. Um, and then once you see either the flowers or the fruits, that's a real giveaway for these. Another troublesome plant. Trying to get some better flowers of this one here. Maybe we won't have any luck with that. This is one of our buckthorns. Uh, we've got a couple of buckthorns. This is called the glossy buckthorn. Um, the buckthorns, they, they don't look a lot alike to me. So this one has uh, pinnately kind of classically pinnate venation on the leaves. Entire margins makes it different from the uh, the other one, the common buckthorn. And uh, I would say they don't necessarily jump out as being glossy, but once you get to get familiar with them, that glossy leaf surface is kind of uh, distinctive. And the flowers here, uh, rather small flowers, and not something we probably would use to identify this plant. Uh, small flowers, inferior ovaries. This is in uh, is buckthorn, basically in the buckthorn family called Ramnaceae. Uh, see over here, we've got one of our graminoids uh, with some flowers going. This is one in the sedge group, uh, Cyperaceae. We haven't seen a lot of sedges yet, and this is uh, not in the, the big genus. So the big genus of sedges is called Carex. We'll see a few of those as we go. Um, this one is... Um, sorry, I'm going to blank. It's, it's a genus that's been split up a little bit. So uh, it used to be Scurpus. I'll give you a look and, and see if I can get a good idea on this one. Uh, the parts of the inflorescence in this group, they tend to look a little more like little cones. Uh, vegetatively, I've got a three-parted stem. So these plants are three-ranked. Uh, there's a mnemonic you can use to help you identify your sedges called Sedges have edges. All right, so I'm looking down at this plant, and you see how the leaves kind of keep going in one of three directions. So that gives it a triangular look, and also actually imparts a triangular cross-section to the stem. So uh, if you have a flowering top of one of these plants, you can roll it around in your fingers and feel the edges of that triangle. So sedges have edges. Uh, on this one, I see some reproductive parts sticking out. I see some yellow. I'm not certain, actually. I think the yellow might be the stigma. Yeah, there's some stamens coming out. Well, suffice to say that the stuff sticking out from these cones of flowers, very small flowers, wind pollinated, uh, stuff sticking out is reproductive, uh, either anthers for male parts or stigmas for the female parts. Uh, another graminoid here, also in the sedge group. Uh, this one has uh, an inflorescence that's a little bit more pendant, so it goes up and then hangs down a little bit. Uh, again, kind of that cone look to the flowers. And then if I try to get in a little closer, um, there's some kind of white fur looking stuff that's coming out. Those are stigmas coming out to grab the pollen. And uh, this one, not quite so sharply triangular. In fact, if I was just looking for a triangular feel, I probably wouldn't say this one has a, a triangular feel, but uh, other characteristics definitely confirm this as a member of the sedge group, Cyperaceae. Uh, we'll look at these in more detail a little bit later. Uh, actually, our third family of graminoids, we've got the grasses, sedges, and then here is a rush. Uh, rush plants also long linear leaves, but rush flowers, this is the genus Juncus, family Juncaceae, uh, rush flowers look more like flowers, and their fruit is a capsule. So this one's all the way almost uh, mature fruit capsules now, with lots of seeds inside of each of those. Uh, the flowers, when they were flowering, would have looked also a little bit more like uh, traditional flowers with six tepals instead. I've just got to show this one off because it has got some giant leaves. Let me get my hand in there for scale. I've got pretty big hands too. All right, so this is a jack-in-the-pulpit. Uh, we've got 
kind of a pretty wide variety of sizes on this one, but only one species. So this is Arisima trifilum. Uh, makes two leaves that are trifoliolate compound. Uh, two leaves and then the pulpit part of Jack in the Pulpit. Uh, refers to what the flower inflorescence looks like. And then after fertilization, it goes on and starts making this uh, cluster of berries. So they're green right now, still developing. You can see some papery bits of the uh, flower covering there. The uh, uh, bract for the inflorescence. And these will turn red later in the year. Uh, much later in the year, sometimes all the way into winter, you see these just sticking up as the uh, fruiting stalk with red berries on them. Kind of confusing if you don't know what you're looking at. All right, now we're still at Bluff Creek, but we've made it out of the shrubby area next to the creek and out into a much more open area. And we can see some of the same plants still here. So uh, when you have habitats that are next to each other, a lot of times you've got some species that cross over. Uh, we saw the meadow rue before, the Electrum daisy carpum, dogwood we've seen before, genus Cornus. Uh, see a lot of our graminoids still in here. Uh, a lot of this, just this arching over aspect. I know one of the things I saw before was an arching over grass, but uh, that arching characteristic is something we often see in our sedges. Uh, let me get up here. I see some sedge flowers here. All right, so these are sedges in the genus Carex, and this is the species that's probably most widely distributed in here. Uh, it's a tussock sedge, and it's actually a, a dominant species in a wet prairie. So uh, as you'll see when we summarize all the data from these, we got lots of species that qualify as wetland species, and this one uh, really chief among them. Uh, lots of individuals of this plant, not lots that are flowering. And let me just show you what we're looking at here. This is a plant that has separate male and female uh, spikelets. So this is a... Uh, female spikelet that's developing into uh, akeen fruits. And then up here, often at the tip of a sedge, uh, you'll see some kind of papery leftovers. This is the place where the male flowers were attached. And uh, this time of year, the male flowers have done their job and faded. So we can really just see where they used to be. So attachment points for male flowers. And then down here, uh, actual female flowers still developing into fruits. And, uh, and this one... Looks like it got its reproduction on pretty early in the season, so I can uh, take those fruits apart, these Akeens. Uh, I don't know if they were all ready to go, but looks like we've got some, some round Akeens in there. Uh, some other plants we saw before, we did see the uh, northern bed straw here, Gallium boreale. And let me find one, and then I'll show you. All right, so one I was looking for here uh, this is one that also flowers later. I know I'm saying that a lot today, but um, I guess that's the advantage of myself having been through these habitats a few times before. I can recognize these plants uh, before they're flowering and when they're in their sterile conditions. Uh, it's really an acquired skill. I don't think I'd really... Uh, again, as I think I mentioned before, you don't, don't really key out plants in their vegetative state. It's just uh, really challenging for a, a novice. Uh, but this one has opposite leaves. So opposite, kind of linear, maybe lanceolate. I think I call that lanceolate leaf. Leaves are opposite, but here we've got a uh, axillary bud growing out quite a bit. So it looks like a lot of leaves. Maybe this is a good example of paying attention, uh, a little closer attention to what's going on. So two leaves across from each other, opposite, and then side, side shoots growing out of the axils of each of those leaves. Uh, so opposite leaves and then a square stem and the opposite leaves with the stair stem, square stem also mean that the leaves are going out, uh, we call decussate. So uh, opposite to the left and right, and then at the node above them, opposite to the uh, sort of front and back, so toward us and away from us. So alternating in those two dimensions gives us that square appearance. Uh, that calls to mind the mint family, uh, as does the smell. If you crush these leaves and smell them, uh, there's just sort of a, an herb kind of smell to plants in the mint family, sometimes leaning a little more minty, sometimes a little more like oregano. Uh, those are both plants in the mint family. And uh, those are smells that, that will probably confirm that you've got a plant in the mint family. Uh, this one actually has the common name of Virginia Mountain Mint, Pycnanthemum virginianum, uh, another one that's pretty common in wetlands. 
Uh, I see another sedge. We saw the sedge, the uh, dominant tussock sedge in here. And we've got another sedge with fatter, fatter Achaeans. I would put this as a different species. Um, so spikelets of a good number of female flowers that are now developing into fruits. Uh, this is the state you typically find your sedges in, or at least the state you could typically identify them in. Uh, we might look at them in greater detail. Just takes a lot of practice and dedication to get to know your sedges uh, very well, uh, at least being able to identify a new sedge. So two female fruiting spikelets, and then at the top, a uh, papery leftovers of the male attachment locations. Uh, while we're here, I did notice over here we have a plant that has open flowers on it. I uh, saw before that we had some members of the uh, bean family in this vetch group. So this might be the same one we saw before. Uh, winged stem. So it's kind of flat but broad. And then uh, I've seen lots of members of the bean family. Very beany flowers, bilaterally symmetrical. The big standard petal up top. And uh, these develop into bean fruits later. We see uh, pinnately compound leaves with tendrils at the tips. So that's a good character to look for as you're identifying these. Uh, as well as the stipules are sometimes useful. So big stipules at the leaf base there. Uh, alternate pinnately compound leaves with entire margins. So we're still in a mostly open part of the habitat, but we do have some more shrub presence than we had before. Uh, I've got some glossy buckthorn here. Uh, pretty common around me. Uh, neat plant in front of me here is a bog birch. So this is a birch plant and it doesn't get all that big. So it uh, grows in full-on wet soil. You can check its uh, wetland indicator status. Uh, birches have serrate leaves. Sometimes serrate in two, order, two orders, but it uh, looks like just generally serrate there, pinnate veins. Uh, these have kind of a leathery feel to them. Sometimes that shows up in wetland shrubs. Uh, the, another birchy feature you might look for uh, is in the fruits here. So uh, our birches have basically cones. Uh, so it's a flowering plant, but it produces these more like cone inflorescences. Uh, these would be the female parts that had separate male uh, sprays that released pollen earlier in the year. And then this is uh, not too big, so kind of uh, ascendant small um, cones that are going to release like winged fruits. So uh, another characteristic of birch group here, uh, alternate leaves. And uh, just a kind of a neat one to see in wetland habitat. Uh, another plant we often find, another woody plant often in uh, wetlands, is this one here. We've got uh, a willow. Uh, we've got quite a few willows, so I'm not going to put a name on this just yet. But maybe we can pull some of this out. Uh, willow leaves often have kind of a lanceolate shape. I would call this one more elliptic, um, basically more elongate. Willows are close relatives of the uh, cottonwoods and the aspen that we saw before. Uh, but their leaves tend to be more elongate. So um, I don't know if I could tell you exactly why I know this is a willow. Again, the, the habitat kind of starts me thinking about uh, the a right place for willows to belong. They grow in wet soil typically. Um, they've got some pretty big stipules a lot of times. So I'll show you the stipules there. So I keep taking these apart. Uh, there's a couple of good stipules still attached. Uh, at the base of this leaf. Uh, in this case, we've got pretty big difference between the adaxial kind of shiny green surface and the abaxial. Uh, I think we'd probably see some, some wax on that if we got it under a uh, closer inspection. So kind of a waxy underside of these leaves. Uh, alternate leaves also. I uh, don't see anything reproductive on here yet. Uh, one thing that will catch your eye if you're walking through here is this lovely spray of pink flowers. I think we'll look at this one without pulling it up. Um, this is a phlox. It's actually a close look-alike for one of our weeds. So I'd say if you see plants that look like this, you're more likely to be seeing uh, one of our plants called Dame's Rocket, which is a weed. Um, and that one you would know by having four petals. So phlox with five petals. 
uh, joined together into a tube, pretty substantial flower tube there if you see it from the side. And then we've got uh, opposite leaves. That was something you wouldn't see in the Dame's Rocket either. And uh, this would be a kind of a special plant found in this habitat. There's a shrub here that caught my eye. Uh, this is one in a rather diverse group of shrubs we have called Viburnum in family Adoxaceae. And uh, in a lot of ways, it's got kind of a maple look. So the leaves are not unlike a maple. Uh, maple leaves are opposite, just like this one. Uh, the inflorescence, though, really gives you away as a uh, member of this Viburnum or arrowwood group. And so these are like a flat-topped uh, inflorescence we would call a corum, or if you want to just simplify it down, you could call it a, a panicle. We saw one before that had this kind of umble look to it, so you could even be forgiven for calling these umbles or compound umbles. Uh, just so lots of branching. Would have had white petaled flowers earlier as they were flowering. Now we're developing into fruits. Uh, fruits come in, let's see, reds mostly in this group. Here's another member of the sedge family uh, called the soft stem bulrush. Uh, bulrush is not a rush, and it's pretty, I don't think you'd really mistake it for a rush, but it's in the common name bulrush, so just watch out for that. Uh, sure enough, it does have like a spongy stem. It's round all around, so it kind of breaks our uh, sedges have edges guideline. And uh, looking up at the inflorescence, again, that kind of cone look to the spikelet. And this is a really good time of year to see these flowering. So you might need more uh, of a fruiting characteristic to key them out. Uh, but right now we're looking at lots of stigmas sticking out from there. Uh, different time of year, we might have seen more stamens coming out, or, or anthers, I should say. I don't have much to go on with this one. This is another shrub, and I would put this in the arrowwood group as well. So another viburnum. Uh, the leaves are maybe similar to what you see on a cherry, so uh, elliptic, pretty broad, and uh, serrate toothed margins, pinnate venation, but uh, what you would not see in a cherry is this opposite phyllotaxis. So opposite phyllotaxis on a shrub uh, should get you thinking about dogwoods, or uh, this is a pretty common group. We have lots of species in the arrowwoods, viburnum family, adoxaceae. So just a little note about the habitat here. This is a site called a fen, uh, which is a habitat that's a wetland with water that's sort of sourced from underground. So it may not have standing water. Uh, and in fact, the water here, if I go uphill, we've moved up from the creek, which is behind me, and I'm going up the hill and there's some standing water up the hill. So this isn't, there's really no reason there should be water just lying around in this location. Uh, it's actually welling up from the ground. There's a part of this site called Bluff Springs. So Bluff Springs contributes to Bluff Creek. Uh, so there's a springs where the water comes up from underground and feeds this site, keeps the ground wet. And so uh, that's the reason a lot of the plants I've mentioned to you are what we'd more consider as wetland plants. Even though you don't look around and see all that, uh, it, it doesn't immediately strike you as a wetland. You don't see open water, uh, except as I mentioned, the creek, which is still downhill from us quite a bit. So uh, this contributes to the soil conditions that allow the wetland plants to thrive. Uh, it's even more special. It's kind of a, a little more alkaline habitat. This is south of whitewater. This is a characteristic of the water that actually gave whitewater its name. Uh, that whiteness is the calcium precipitates out of the more limestone bedrock here. So really special site uh, with special plants. And so these conditions are not met a lot of other places and that makes them uh, a little rare in the state and specific to this kind of habitat. Speaking of wetlands, I think it's probably worth mentioning that of course we have cattails growing through here. Uh, if you were just going through your average prairie and you saw cattails growing, uh, that would not make a lot of sense. But again, with the wet substrate here, uh, cattails growing here makes perfect sense. Uh, cattails have, maybe from a distance you can see, they, they have long linear leaves and they tend to kind of spin around a little bit as they grow so it gives it this look where you sometimes see it uh, the same leaf from the side and also flat on uh, pretty easy to identify from a distance on those uh, this soil you can actually kind of see i can manipulate the soil so you see i'm pushing down with my boot and all kinds of stuff is moving around there so this is very mucky soil 
uh, very organic. So this is the bodies of old plants that we're standing on here. So this is uh, gives it some spongy character. Uh, another feature that you find of uh, certain wetland types like fen here. So uh, that spongy substrate is actually another thing that these uh, plants basically need uh, to, to grow here. Uh, we saw one before, we saw a false Solomon seal, and I just wanted to point out that this one has some uh, flower remnants. I think I would call this one my Anthemum stellatum. Uh, here's one that has moved on to produce some fruits. Got a cute little uh, pigmented stripe on there. I think that goes away. I think these mature red, if I remember correctly. All right, another uh, spot with a little bit of open water here. And uh, based on where I stepped not a minute ago, uh, this was a, a very wet place to step. So I'm not going to risk it. I bet if I stepped in here, I would fall in uh, a couple feet. So I'm not going to do that. But I can point out some of the plants that are different from what we've seen already. Uh, here's yet another kind of sedge. Uh, again, in that really diverse group called uh, the genus Carex. Sorry, let me put this in my holder here. And there we go. There we go. Need a hand. All right. Uh, all right, so another Carex sedge. Uh, much fatter here. So these are fat spikelets. Um, kind of a few, looks more like a corn cob, a few uh, ranks of fruits coming out. Really long uh, styles. So in this group, Carex, the style uh, and the ovary are actually wrapped up in this teardrop-shaped uh, bract called a perigenium, and that's a characteristic of the sedges. So a uh, very diverse group, lots of species of this genus Carex, and uh, good to get familiar with those uh, describing words. Uh, let's talk about these if you're going to identify some Carex plants. So female spikelets developing, male spikelets kind of left over, uh, and this one does have a nice triangular stem. Uh, one more in here. Easily overlooked, I would say, especially some of these smaller ones. Uh, these are also in the sedge family, Cyperaceae. And it's just a, like a round stem terminated by one cone. And that's a characteristic of this genus uh, called Eliochorus, or the common name is uh, Spike Rush. And these are pretty commonly found in wetlands. Um, and I would say in this area, I don't know if you can see them, uh, you can see some flowering heads and some just sterile. Uh, they tend to be kind of short stature and uh, kind of wiry leaves on those. So something to watch out for in your wetlands. Uh, spike rushes. All right, let's do one last habitat overlook. Uh, this is habitat that's got a lot of open ground, some shrubs in the background, and uh, really to call to mind the fact that this is a wetland, probably one of the easier wetland plants to identify is our cattails here. So a group of little cattails there. Looks like your ordinary prairie maybe from a distance until uh, you get in and see it in greater detail. So uh, knowing the plants that are here really tells you, uh, obviously if you couldn't tell that there's wet ground under your feet, uh, the plants would then tell you that's what you've got. Uh, I got one over here, a nice big flower. So we saw the multi-flora multi -flora rose previously. There we go, focus. Uh, this is one of our native roses and uh, similar features to the other rose. So pinnately compound. Here we've got, uh, what we got? Five and a half leaflets, that's interesting. Uh, usually an odd number of leaflets. Uh, stipules here, not that fringed stipule that we saw in... Sorry, focus is not being my friend today. Focus. There we go. Uh, not the fringed stipules we saw in the multiflora rose, but more entire. Uh, and then, of course, this much smaller number of flowers and a giant, much larger flowers here. So um, I'll try to get it from the side. Uh, rose flowers have an interesting, uh, they're, they're related to apples and they're almost a little bit like apples in their appearance. Um, so over on the, on the right side of that flower is a green circle, which is the uh, developing 
fruit basically of this they call it a rose hip and that is uh, inferior to the flowers you can kind of see the location of the ovaries in this flower uh, lots of stamens that's characteristic of the rose family as well as the five petals so we've taken a little trip down to the water here and before we get in the water i just want to show you one uh, that jumped out at me this is a member of the carrot family uh, APACE. APACE has uh, round, hollow stems. Uh, kind of some ridges along the stem as well, but overall pretty round. Uh, in this case, we have actually uh, sessile compound leaves. So I took a little bit of the sheath there. That sheathing leaf base is uh, characteristic of this group. So uh, celery belongs to this group. You maybe want to think about a celery stalk that flares out at the base. Uh, that's what's going on with these leaves here. And uh, pretty distinctive flowers, kind of, kind of crazy. I don't know. I've grown fond of this one. Um, so members of the carrot family typically have uh, umbels for their inflorescence or compound umbels, and we're conforming to that basically. So down here we've got three branches coming out of that part of the inflorescence. Three. So these are uh, whorls at least. Uh, not not a whole lot of umbel there. And then the individual flowers are pretty crazy so the showy ones here uh, we got separate male and female flowers the showy ones are male and actually i don't know that i've gotten those i've seen those before that's exciting the female flowers uh, a little more reduced just sticking their stigmas out uh, maybe a little harder to see let me try to get an individual one here that's where the fun payoff is uh guess that's one so the individual flower has an inferior ovary that uh, has a lot of these hooked hairs on it so it's on the small side uh, but it has a similar approach to burdock and other plants that have hooked hairs to grab onto animal fur pretty cool plant called uh, sanicula all right so it wouldn't be a trip to bluff creek without visiting the creek so here we are uh, kind of fast moving creek here and uh, I'm on land, of course, kind of overlooking this. There's a pretty steep drop-off here, uh, certainly big by the scale of the plants that are growing here. So I'll show you some wetland plants in the near vicinity first. This is another one of our sedges. So this is uh, another one with like the cone tops. Uh, I would call this scurpus, but I think the genus has changed again. We'll double check on that one. Uh, here's a grass. I think we might have started looking at this grass. So here it is again. Uh, kind of drooping inflorescence. We can take a closer look at that later. And then uh, moving down into the water, we get some plants that are growing in the water. So being able to grow in the water is a special skill for a plant, uh, not one that we see too typically. And uh, plants that grow in the water have to be able to basically get uh, air to their roots to be able to breathe, and so they need special adaptations for that. Uh, what you do often see, not always, but usually in uh, underwater plants is that they are uh, flowering above the water. So this is one in the mustard family called watercress, and uh, some of the leaves underwater are this plant. Um, so these leaves here, these watercress leaves underwater, and then when it gets above water, this is what it looks like, so it produces those uh, characteristic mustard family flowers, four petals, uh, the fruits, long capsules. Uh, other ones, another thing with aquatic plants is you don't often see them flowering. So uh, sometimes they'll go through a whole year, an individual will go through the year without flowering at all. Uh, this one gets the fun common name of water weed. This is Elodea. Uh, individual leaves are whorled, so three at a time. Uh, they're a little bit kind of finely toothed, but otherwise sort of uh, lanceolate shaped. And uh, when they flower, those flowers are also above the water surface. Uh, here's an interesting one. So this one has leaves that are uh, what we call dissected. Uh, the leaves have been divided down so they're basically just leaves made up of veins. That increases their surface area so that they can interact with water nutrients. Um, this plant live mostly underwater. Uh, the leaves themselves are alternate. 
So this one's coming out of the side of the stem. You can see a bit of a sheathing leaf base there. And offhand, I'm not sure about that one. We've got a couple that look like this. We've got some uh, members of the buttercup family. That might be, I think I'm leaning, leaning buttercup right now for that one. Get you a confirmation later. Uh, let's see over here. One of our invasive aquatic plants. Uh, this is curly pondweed, curly leaf pondweed. Alternate leaves, a uh, little bit toothy on the margin. And then the curly part refers to this wavy margin. Uh, curly is often used to describe this, where the margin kind of overgrows itself and, and ends up kind of uh, waving around a little bit. And that's it for now.